Okay, so your question is, was there a concept of an interlude in Greek plays? Well, in serious plays or tragedy, there was nothing like an interlude. But uh, in comedies, there would be certain kinds of episodes which perhaps could be interpreted as interludes. Uh, what is called interlude? is something which uh, develops later on in drama and uh, later on in uh, even tragic writing in the Roman period. Well, your question is, uh, do the actors occupy the space as it is shown in this uh, picture? Yes, the actors occupy the space only on the stage what is called the logion, you know that little strip that you see. The actors, the speak, those who act like the main characters. Those who are in this horseshoe, they are the dancers. There are no names for them. They are not the people uh, who become characters. But then they represent sometimes, let us say, they represent characters in the sense that they show the location. For instance, uh, it may be like the, like the women of a particular place. The chorus may be representing the people or it may be representing a certain class of people. And they would be dressed like that. They would be shown like that. But those who would do the acting, they would be only on that logion or, or on that stage. Right? You see, if you go to any Greek amphitheater, what you would see that this whole architecture of the inverted bone, you know, if you look at this total picture of the Greek amphitheater, including the steps on which the audience is sitting, then the orchestra and at the end the logion. The whole thing looks like an inverted bowl, isn't it? As if you have taken a bowl, inverted it. And there is no canopy, but it, it's, it's a bowl, right? Now, if you see this bowl, you will find that the acoustics are perfect. Whatever is spoken, on the logion, on the stage, is heard by the person sitting in the last top row. And uh, if you go to Greece today, you will find the guides there uh, dropping a coin on the stage, asking you first to go and sit at the last row, then they'll drop a coin, and you will hear the sound of the coin. So it is all acoustically designed. It's perfect natural acoustics. That's the great marvel of it. All right, all right. I see that it makes a lot of sense. What you are saying is, uh, I hope you are not saying that Nataraj is Dionys uh, Dionysos. Although uh, some of the ancient Greek writers, they made this observation as Anilji knows very well that uh, Dionysos was Shiva. So, leaving aside that uh, controversy, the idea that God comes and sees is also a Hindu idea. The Natya Shastra makes it very clear that gods are watching, that Natya was created for the gods and men both. As a matter of fact, it is Indra who says that I want to see something wonderful and then Natya or the fifth Ved is given. Kridaniya Kamichamo. So you see, so there is this exact parallel. Uh, you will find many, many more great, great parallels. If you read my book, Dramatic Concepts, Greek and Indian, it was written and published in 1994. It has been reprinted about 12 times by now and uh, I have not uh, seen anybody who has contested my fundamental 
uh, thesis. Uh, so what you are saying is is really correct, and I have said made many many more comparisons like that. Yes, your question is flute an Indian instrument or a uh, Greek instrument. Now you see, I think flute is an instrument which was the second kind of an instrument which was created and it was created in many parts of the world without uh, borrowing from anywhere. So we have uh, very very ancient flutes in China. In Greece uh, uh, in the uh, you know in the Aegean Sea uh, there are uh, little statues playing the Diabolos or the double, uh, you know, this double reed flute, uh, which go up to 7000 BC. Very old. In India also they mention flutes as one of the fundamental categories. You see, all instruments are divided into four categories. There is the flute, there is the drum, there is the string, and then there is a solid instrument. Now, all these instruments were created all over the world simultaneously by human beings. Later on, once uh, there was a very professional playing, then there was a massive exchange and instruments traveled from one country to another. But sometimes, uh, you know, we make a mistake if only the name travels. Like uh, the Persian word for drum is tabla. So when the, when the Arabs came to India, they called the mridanga tabla. And then somebody wrote that tabla was invented by the Arabs. Now you make that kind of mistakes uh, or anybody would make. But uh, somebody who knows musicology and history of music uh, would tell you that this is not true. Uh, the fundamental four categories of mu uh, musical instruments have been invented all over the world simultaneously. And then later on when they became uh, uh, proficient instruments, uh, they traveled from one country to another. Yes, sir. All right, your question on mine. Now here, I would ask uh, Professor Singh to show the masks. You know, there are two pictures. One is a picture of uh, a satyr, and then there is there are two pictures of masks. So let us have a look at uh, those pictures. And uh, once you have a look at those pictures, some things would become very clear. But while he is uh, trying to put those things on screen one by one, and let me tell you that mime is a very different thing. Mime is considered to be a kind of a paste mask. That is, they hide the features of an individual and make it into a mask but which is not separate from the face. So it is a paste mask, like you have in Kathakali, Kudiyatta, which is called Chotti, I think, if I am not wrong. The, the Malayali word for that is Chotti. So you put a mask by making a paste on your face. This is a paste mask or called Lepanam in uh, Natya Shastra or Mukharaga. Now, this was used in India and in India we also use mask in the sense that there was something uh, which is now called Mukhota but which is a separate mask. Now the Greeks used that separate mask but they call that not a mask, they call that a face, prosopon. Yeah, now here you have the example of a woman mask. Now this of course is a stone version. 
the real versions were made out of paper mache or very light wood but it would be something like this now you can see that the face uh, the lips are wide open the mouth is wide open and through the eyes the actress or the actor there was no actress at that time women did not go on to the stage uh, they were only part of the chorus uh, they uh, performed in the chorus but on the stage it was male actors so the actor would put on this mask this is a mask of a comedy and through this the person would speak now speaking this would amplify the sound and it would render it more powerful it will go far beyond right into the last row so this is the mask uh, there is another mask if you can show professor now these masks were put on the head you know they were put on the head and uh, every greek actor or actress or every greek character on the stage had to wear that mask because in an amphitheater you had to make the actor or the actress larger than life you had to increase the size you had to make so therefore uh, they had a dress which made it them appear bigger very often they had boots or sometimes even stilts so that they would be much taller than what they were actually because you wanted to see something much bigger than real and yes, they would be wearing that mask yes i'm able to see them yeah i am able to see this uh, now mask now this is again a mask of a uh, well it could be of a satiricon or a comic character not a tragedy character uh, but it's a male person and uh, uh, it is uh, i have photographed it from the athens museum all these photographs that you are seeing uh, they were taken by me uh, and later on i am going to make a whole uh, book in hindi and in uh, uh, in telugu on ancient greek theater so they would be used there so this is the mask the greeks did not use the paste for the obvious reasons because paste mask is effective as in kathakali kudiyattam or uh, bailata or uh, uh, any other art form in india when you are closer to the audience so that you can see how the lips are quivering the nostrils are quivering now this cannot happen in an ancient greek theater here you have big distances so the greeks were using this mask Uh, you could show another picture professor of the satyricon you know i think i sent you one or two more pictures of what is a satyricon yes sir i am trying now a satyricon uh, i'll describe is a mixed creature till the navel it is a goat so from navel uh upwards it is a human being an old man and uh down it is a goat now you know that goats are famous for their sexual prowess and therefore the uh this satyricon which is now appearing on the screen is a goat and uh, it is an old man wearing a uh well like the indian shawl very much which the greeks also used because the greek uh, male dress consisted of two parts something like our lungi and an uh, upari vastram and uh, this is the satyricon and you can see that very prominently it has hooves uh the hooves of a goat so 
Some people think this is a picture of Dionysos, but uh, I doubt, I'm not very sure. Maybe it is, but uh, this is certainly uh, a satyricon. So here I see uh, these two pictures which were satyricons were part of either comedy or they were part of another third genre called uh, satyricon. So the Greeks had tragodoia, uh, uh, you know, tragudi, that is now tragudi in modern Greek means song or singing, but uh, tragos means the goat. And the song of the goat is Travodia. Travos plus Udia, Travodia. And then you have Comedia, which is comedy, and Satyricon. So here is a Satyricon, and the characters in the Satyricon were these. Well, Upasana, your question is very complicated. You have said that why is it that uh, this realistic kind of acting and realistic kind of character has appeared and in order to create those uh, characters uh, we have the theater of the theater writer. Now this is uh, true, what you say is entirely true, but this is a development from European theater. It has nothing to do with ancient Greek theater. As I told you right in the beginning of this lecture that uh, Europe was able to revive only a few things from ancient Greek theatre because that was their limitation. They had no access to anything else and also there were certain other limitations. Uh, largely it was Christianity again because Christianity would not <laughs> allow them to present uh, divinity on stage. You see Christianity or Islam does not a, a allow the descent of the divine on the stage or in this world. They can be God, you know the Father, Allah is never in the world. It's always above the world. So for this reason all this divinity was stripped and you could have only human characters. Now if you have human characters then they would be more or less like human beings you see around in the street. And when you see them then they would be realistic. They would not be conventional, they would not be imaginative, they would not be creatures out of this world. Right? Right. Yeah. Um, I had another question that I had put a little earlier. Well, the question is about choosing. What I should choose? You gave the example of Bhagavad Gita. Should Arjun run away because his, uh, his uncles and grandparents and gurus are confronting him? Or should he fight? Be killed or killed, right? Similarly, in Greek plays, in Greek plays, the same kind of a choice. There is this famous play in which the woman has to bury her brothers. But then she's, the state says you will not. If you bury, then we will kill you. Now she is faced with a dilemma. Should she perform her duty, her dharma, her, you know, her uh, diki and bury the brothers and obey the cosmic law or should he, she obey the king and then she chooses. Now making the right, right choice is called ethos from which you have the English word ethic, ethics. In, in, in Greek it is ethiki. So ethiki means is choosing the, the, the right word. 
it is the right making the right choice one who is able to make the right choice is the hero so you have guessed it very correctly that uh, it is like arjuna's choice or uh, <coughs> bhishma's choice or karna's choice the, the, the here the moral choice is the real choice and it is fundamental in this situation you see their morality is not shall i take a bribe or shall i not take a bribe it's not about social reform it is about these most fundamental questions yeah well you have asked a question uh, presuming that greek that, that women at athens did not have as much freedom as uh, women in sparta did now this is not historically true actually nobody had as much freedom in uh, sparta as people had in athens you see uh, sparta was uh, something very similar to a communist state where everybody had to be a military person where even women had to take military training and it was a regimented state so it is not true at all and uh, uh, please uh, just check a bit of history and you will get the answer uh, a very interesting question by rashma uh, of course i am very happy that rashma is here rashma is as professor uh, anil singh said not only a performer she is also a playwright and she has written several plays and that's why she is asking this question about uh, genre change and the question is that did europe in later years from 19th century onwards uh adopt realism uh, because they wanted to represent the common man well there is a great truth in what you are saying the shift is that we want that they wanted at that time to represent the society which was not just at the lower or the middle end but society which was actual so they wanted only terrestrial characters if you look at it in ancient terms they did not want any divine characters now there was in this theater as i said earlier in in the european theater there was a problem because in this christian culture you could not have it the divine on the stage so you could have only the monarchs you could have only the upper classes and as uh, european society got democratized or parliamentized or enlightenment came in they started thinking more and more about the world as the real world of human beings before their eyes so the cosmos was reduced to social classes and when you want to talk of social classes then you come into realism and you are right because you want to talk about social classes which class is oppressing which class which class wants to Uh, come out of oppression so we have now the theater of social reform in a ancient greek play you do not have that not that they were not concerned with it not that they had not that they were not representing lower class characters yes they were in comedy it's full of uh, uh, you know working class people Uh, somebody who is a shoemaker or somebody who is a meat seller things like that you have plenty of those characters in comedy but the purpose there is different because in ancient greek theater you had to have the three worlds the world of gods the worlds of human beings and the worlds of the underworld the underworld is not satanic in greek terms the daimon is a spirit the daimon is not the christian demon please understand that the greek underworld is not a hell 
It's, I mean, it is hell translated, but uh, it is not hell in the Christian sense. It's not a uh, place where you are sent to uh, repent or to be punished. So, in the Greek world, in the Greek thought, uh, there was something much bigger than social classes to be represented. That's why uh, realism came into being in uh, Europe. So in 19th century, and then the great heyday of this was from Ibsen to George Bernard Shaw. And then of course it all break into absurd theater. They got sick of it. And absurd theater brings European theater back to the cosmic questions, like waiting for Godot and oh, onwards. Did, did yeah, any, uh, I think I think Professor Anil uh, Kumar Singh has put things very appropriately. Uh, as a classicist, I always feel that we tend to judge the ancient cultures. Uh, with a prejudice. Uh, let us uh, all become aware of one of the major evils of our society, uh, primarily European society, and we have taken this uh, evil from them in India also, that we think that there is an evolution in culture, there is an evolution in human values, and then modern times are the best times in history. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but then we have had Corona and this has proved that uh, this is one of the lowest and the most depraved moments of human history where people are engaged in biological warfare or mysterious things and God knows what. So let us be humble. Let us judge cultures for what they have achieved and what values they created. Those values may not be our values. Those values are certainly not values for the future. So I would not say that uh, solutions for everything of the future, of the present, lies in the past. But then I would say again, again and again, that unless you evaluate the beautiful achievements of the past in your own culture, in other cultures that have achieved greatness at certain times, you really cannot prepare for a better future. So that's my comment. So with this uh, 